from the man who wrote the book on human behavior. A special edition Richard Flint podcast. Let's talk about it. Let's talk human behavior. Here's Richard to explain. Richard Flint. And I want to welcome you to Let's Talk Human Behavior. Uh, This is a show dedicated to helping us gain a greater understanding about the people in our life. You see, each individual is two things. They're a person, which is the individual that we see. And they're a personality, which is a part of the person we experience through their behavior. The confusion that individuals bring to our life is actually not created by the person, but by the personality. You see, reality is the person you see is consistent while the personality you experience changes a minimum of four times a day. Let's Talk Human Behavior is dedicated to helping you gain a clearer, a calmer, and a more positive understanding of those who are part of your life. And I got to tell you something. One of the things I love about this show, I love being able to introduce you to people who can expand your understanding of human behavior and offer you insights that can increase your personal value to those who share presence with you. Now, one of the questions I frequently get asked is, where do I find the guests for my show? And my response is always, they just seem to appear in my life. And that something, because everybody has a that something, they bring tells me I need to share them with you. My guest today was a stranger until a few weeks ago. I was in Atlanta filming some shows for a T.C. Bradley show, God Made Millionaires. And one of the other guests was a young lady, Pamela Mum. I I don't, and I didn't know who she was. I didn't know what she did or the power of her presence. I said, I listened to her interview and I thought, I need to introduce her to you, my audience. So here she is. Pamela, welcome. I am so honored to have you as a part of our today's show of Let's Talk Human Behavior. I love that. It's so good to see you. It's good to be with you. And I love that it's called Let's Talk Human Behavior. I didn't know that until you just did your intro. And that was beautiful. I you love that. You didn't know that was the name of my show? I didn't know that was the consistent, like, I knew your <laughs> books and stuff. And it was like, oh, no wonder you're so brilliant. I love it. <laughs> well, you know, when we were in Atlanta and I sat and I listened to you uh, do your interview with uh, TC, I was really intrigued by you. And I, and I got to tell you this, and anybody who knows me knows this about me. Uh, there are not many people who impress me because I don't think most people are an original. I think they're a composite or a carbon copy and that they don't have the belief, the trust and the faith in their self to be the original uh, that God put them on this earth to be. But as I sat and I listened to you and I felt your presence, uh, I felt you were genuine. And that's what made me reach out to you and ask you if you and I uh, could talk and if you'd be willing to share Pamela with uh, the audiences that we generate here with Let's Talk Human Behavior. And because uh, they don't know you, and I want them to know you, uh, tell them about Pamela. Who are you? Yeah, um, well, I think that I am a singing and dancing spirit on this planet who happens to now work with individuals within businesses But even as I'm doing that, my spirit, I think, is still singing and dancing. I think I am, like, supposed to be this song that just kind of resonates through the planet and and kind of turns up the vibrancy in in people's lives. And some people like the playlist that comes with Pamela Mum, and some people (laughs) want to actually switch channels because they're like, I don't know what that is. But I I love it. I think throughout my, my... like um, transitions through life. You know, I sang and danced when I was young. I took that into college. I was singing and dancing through college. I was a music therapist. I started my 
ability to facilitate groups in a psychiatric hospital, which was just an amazing place to actually learn how to be with people, regardless of what's going on in their life. After that, I decided that I was, I was kind of tired. I would take a lot of the psychiatric hospital issues home with me at night. And I kind of, I just didn't have the ability to separate myself from that. And I thought, you know, I really want to start working with students. I want to work with kids so that I could help to maybe um, help them figure out how to live life and never end up in a psychiatric hospital, which most people don't end up in a psychiatric hospital. But there was something about that, that I wanted to be more at the cause end rather than the effect end of a young person's life. So I went into teaching and I was a high school vocal music teacher for 20 years. Along the way, I had other odd jobs. I was a restaurant manager. I helped open up restaurants. I was a ballroom dancer. I was a competitive ballroom dancer. And everything in my life just kind of laid itself out in a way that, every, well, I would say that every single step was divinely orchestrated so that you know, everything built on each other. And now I work with companies and I have a, a program, it's called Harmonic Performance, which incorporates a lot of the lessons in music then into leadership and into team dynamics and into how to show up as an individual and, and actually find the song that is yours rather than like what you said, you know, don't try to, don't try to be somebody else, just be yourself and trust that yourself is plenty and it's good. Well, you know, one of the things that I found, because we all have a journey, mm -hmm. and sometimes we end up at a place where we never thought that that journey would uh, take us. Yes. So would it be safe to say that uh, where you are today in your life is not something that was on your sketch pad? Yeah, absolutely. Not even close. I always knew that I wanted to be in music, right? Like, I knew that from the time I was little. And I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. I always knew that. It wasn't until I got to college that this, this idea of psychology and music, that they crossed paths and that that intersected with teaching. And it seemed like that is just the best of all worlds for me, for what, what really motivates me and what, what fills me. And then when I got into coaching or executive coaching, strategic planning, team dynamics, I had no idea how much I was going to lean into the teaching part. Like, I believe that is my lane. It's the teaching and it's the teaching combined with knowing that people are, are wonderful, that even though people can be annoying, nobody shows up to be annoying and they're not actually even creating that. I'm creating that they're annoying. And once I started to get my head wrapped around that, it was like, wow, this is, this really is how I show up in the world. I'm a teacher and I have to own that. And I love owning that. And now I teach adults within companies. Well, one of the things that I believe is that everybody has a stage mm -hmm. and that we all are given unique talents and unique abilities. And we are at the, the top of our life <laughs> when we find the stage that we're to stand on. And you know, the, the process of life, uh, like with me, I thought I wanted to teach. I did pra practice teaching and decided I don't want to spend my life with this. <laughs> so I went on to grad school. I finished grad school. I went on then to teach at the university level. And I came away thinking, I don't want to spend my life uh, with this. And then I ended up on the staff of a, uh, of a, a church. And I felt at home there until the church raised its ugly head because every church has within it its own set of challenges yeah. and its own set of people who do not want the church to grow. Mm. And so I left there and then I decided I would just, I would run the private counseling center. I did that and then wrote some magazine articles, got some attention, started doing this with my life of what I do today and decided this is my stage and you're at your best when you're on your stage. So where Pamela is today for this junction in her life, is this her stage? 
I believe so, for sure. I the and I know that because when I get into like when I'm on my stage, when I'm in my lane, when I'm talking about um, like what what actually happens for people when they show up in a unique way or they show up in their authentic way, and and we just unpack life and figure out how to be our very best in any situation with any people. I could go on about that for hours. I mean, I could bore everybody. And at the end of it, I would still have more to say and I'd want to learn more and I'd want to discover more. So I, I can tell that it is exactly where I'm supposed to be because I love it. it I, this would be my, I am a geek about this. I am a nerd about this and I love it. It fills me like no other thing. All right, let me put you to the test, okay? You ready? Okay. Ready, okay. okay. I know that when you're standing on the stage where you're supposed to be in your life, yes. that, that stage presents you with three things. Okay. Number one, presents you with happiness. And happy, happiness to me is inner joy and peace. Is that you? Oh, 100%. 100%. Okay. The second thing, when you're on the right stage, it presents to you is there is a sense of fulfillment that goes with it. You know, at the end of the day, that you feel fulfilled. Doesn't mean that some days you're not always ready to jump up and down, but that you feel fulfilled with that day and it's brought something to your life. A hundred percent, every day. Okay. And then the third thing, when you're on the right stage, you have this sense of freedom mm -hmm. that I can walk in, I can be me. I don't have to prove myself. I can just come in and be the authentic me. Yes, 100%. And actually, out of all three things that you just said, the third one is the one that took me the longest to be okay with it, right? Because there was parts of me that as I would talk about it, I would keep I would keep thinking about, well, what if somebody doesn't agree with this? Or what if somebody is, you know, they think that I'm just hokey for thinking this way. And so I would, I would actually enter into that a little apprehensive. And it wasn't until, a, you know, like, I don't know, a couple of years into this, actually more than that, probably, that I started to just own that I got to be the expert in my life. I got to be the expert at being me. And once I, once I wrapped my head around that part, the freedom showed up, but the freedom, it was not there immediately for me, but it is there now. So yes, a hundred percent. It just took me a while to realize that one. Well, I think sometimes whenever we're, we're just climbing up to the stage and we're taking those steps one at a time, I think uh, one of the things that challenges us the most is uh, the doubt about whether this is the right stage for me. And mm -hmm. then I worry about, can I really do this? And yes. then I, I, I bury myself with a sense of uncertainty. And sometimes it can keep me from really standing on that stage. I lean on the stage. I don't stand on the stage. Yes, I love that. It's a beautiful picture. And yeah. I totally agree with that. And that is what happened. And then as I kept getting nudged, it was, well, we might as well get on the stage. It's yours. Right now it's, it's waiting there for you. Get on it. <laughs> And the stage really becomes yours when you come to the place where you really believe this is my place. You have the trust, I can make a difference. And you have the faith that I can stand here and I don't need props to hold me up because I am confident enough that I know that this is where I belong. Yep, 100%. Okay, I know that with every decision we make in life, uh, that there is a something that says, that tells us it's okay to take this step. So here you were, you've had different transitions in your life and you've been here, you've been there and now you're where you are. And that transition from being a teacher, I think you said for uh, 20 years, you were a music teacher? Yes. Okay, so what was that something that said, Pamela, you need to make this transition now to the next level of value that you can present to people. Yeah, that one. So 
So when I was teaching, you know, I was um, at the, my last school for 14 years, I believe. And every year I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to quit teaching. And every year there was something that nudged me to stay. And there was another experience and there was another, another like mountain to climb and it was amazing. And actually when I got the nudge to leave, it was unexpected because there were so many times when I actually wanted the nudge to leave and it didn't, didn't happen. It actually was the nudge to stay. And so when it, when it happened to leave, it was at the, the top of the game, you know, and looking at what's our next thing that we're going to go do and really excited about it. And when this nudge came, there was this, yes, I want to go do it. I know it's what I'm supposed to go do now. It was just out of the blue. I had no idea. And then when I had the nudge, it was followed immediately by some well, what if, what if you don't make enough money or what if you don't succeed or what if, and then the nudge came again and it was go, I'm, I'm telling you go. And so then I turned in my resignation, like two, two weeks later, I, it was a, Hey, go do this. And I'd been teaching the John Maxwell material to my students. And I'd been using that to help prepare them to be great adults in the world. So when the, the email came that said that John Maxwell was looking for people to become part of his, his training team, it was like that was the nudge. And then the anxiety. And then the, I, I actually know this is what I'm supposed to do. It's what I've been doing with students. It's what I'm supposed to do now. So I turned it in and I left. <laughs> I, I flew the coop and it was great. So where you are right now at this juncture in your life is where you're supposed to be. Yes. A hundred percent. Okay. Why, why harmonic? I mean, I, that, I figured that goes back somewhere to your, your music background. Uh, but why, why harmonic? Yeah, I think it's because you know, I was playing around with different titles and everything that I do has to do with music. Like I do a lot of exercises that have music. We, you know, there are just uh, random lyrics will come in, we'll sing them, whatever it is. But I think music is just powerful. It's the frequency of it, the connection of it. And so I knew that I wanted something to do with music. And I tried out a bunch of different, a different program titles and I even played around with harmony instead, like just the cohesiveness of that. But then something about harmonic performance, it seemed like it had a higher, a higher resonance, a higher frequency. And it led people into, well, what is that? What it, would it be like to have a harmonic performance, to be in sync with me and my own life and everyone around me? And then I also think that people resonate with music. And so being able to say, oh, I get it. I like when I look at my team, I may not see it. But when I think about an orchestra or when I think about a performing group, I totally understand what it means to be at the top of your game performing well with everyone else. So I thought it was very um, I thought it brought up a great mental image and then had high frequency with it. Yeah, because when you li listen to an orchestra, if one section is out of key, you know it. Yes, yes. And that can that can transform itself into working with organizations. Yes, exactly. So you spend a lot of time your time working with leaders and leadership. Yes, I so, do. So how would how would Pamela define the word leadership? Yeah, for me, the word leadership is showing up in your most authentic way, remaining in your giftedness, and knowing that you are exactly where you need to be, leading the people that you are leading, and being confident in that mission. That, that is an important mission for the world. And then stepping boldly into that space that you're going to take people somewhere they haven't been before. One of the things I find when I work with companies is that in too many companies, 
leader has become a title, not an accountability. Mm -hmm. do, do you find that? And sometimes that creates a tremendous amount of the confusion within the organization. I do. As a matter of fact, this morning, I just had a conversation with a client about that and how to be a leader and to be the leader that you want to be, right? Like that image of yourself. So living into that and being able to hold people accounting, or sorry, being able to hold people accountable without, without betraying who you are as a leader, right? Like being able to show up and be accountable from a place of, I know you can do this, we just haven't done it yet, versus showing up being manipulative or controlling or patronizing or anything that just goes against who people actually want to be. Because whenever I work with leaders, it always seems like they're great until they come up against somebody that isn't doing their job just on their own. And now they have to figure out who do I become in this moment? And how do I hold somebody accountable? while remaining true to who I am. Well, but this raises a very interesting question, and it's one I deal with all the time, and it's one I play with, because uh, I look at people who are, quote, the leader, and I, I know that they have the title, but then what I do is I step back, and I study their relationship with the people they're there to lead. Yes. And I, I find disconnect. So what's missing today? What is missing today in the world of a leader really providing leadership? What do you see? What do you sense? What do you feel as you work with these companies? Well, I think there are a couple of things. Like I love that you look at behaviors, right? Because in anything, there are words, which words are great. But if I have to choose bet between somebody's words and somebody's actions, I will always believe somebody's actions every single time. And so what I see missing is actually the action that is aligned with the authentic leader. Because like this, if I read a book that says the most important thing about leading is relationships, but I don't naturally like lean into relationships. I, I might actually lean into do, doing work together or I might lean into um, conversations or there might be something else that I lean into. Well, if I go out and start preaching that relationships are the most important thing and yet my behaviors don't show up as relationship, now I'm incongruent and now I'm untrustable and now I'm actually showing up as something that is inauthentic to myself and now I'm, I'm viewed as somebody who is not a good leader, simply because I let something outside me determine what it is to be a good leader. I have friends who are great at relationships, and the way they lead is so different than the way I lead. And when I try to lead like they do, I fail every single time. But when I can figure out what is my strength, what do I bring to this, and my actions can be congruent with that, then I step into that leadership role and I can be very effective and it might, it's going to look very different than anybody else. Well, you know, I, I would know that the way that I would approach a leader because of my personality would be different than the way that you would approach a personality because you and I are, are really different, but mm -hmm. see if, see where you are in this. Okay. Because I think every leader, to provide leadership. And there is no leading if there's not a leader providing leadership. Okay, and those three words are separate yet connected. But to me, for a leader to lead through providing leadership, there's certain characteristics they have to have. And to me, the most important is they have to be willing to listen. Do you ever find that a challenge as you're working with leadership? I think people throw the word listen around because I, I think you're spot on, right? Listening is one of the characteristics for sure that when you get good at that, then a lot of things take care of themselves. What I find though is that when people think they're good listeners, 
what they're listening for is, am I doing that? Am I not? Is this, um, is this reflecting well upon me? Is it not? Like they're always comparing what they're listening to, to themselves. And they forget to just listen to be listening. Like there's no secondary part to it. You listen to listen and to understand and to be curious. And a lot of people listen to either be right or to add on or to look good or to justify or to make excuses. So yes, I believe that's a really important characteristic I think sometimes people throw that word around and they don't really know what it means. Oh, I totally agree with you because I think listening is a, a skill that we don't know how to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think, uh, you know, God gave us two ways to listen. He gave us our ears and he gave us our eyes. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer that I hear more of my eyes than I do my ears. Ah, nice. And, I love it. Yeah. And then listening is my ability to lean back and let you talk. Yes. Okay, I and think uh, uh, people who are great leaders, they're also people who will enable the people around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things I find, and I find this in major corporations, is that if, if, you, if I'm your leader, but I see more skill in you than I see in me, then sometimes I don't want to enable you because you might just replace me. Yes. Yes. Do you ever see that? Oh, my goodness, yes. And especially because, again, this goes back to the words and behaviors, right? Words are, I empower my team. Behaviors are, I talk about them behind their back, or I don't delegate work that could make them look good, or I definitely don't delegate work that could make me look bad. So I say one thing, and then I show up a different way. And people who work for leaders like that get so frustrated. Because from the, from the other side of it, all people want is to be given an opportunity to show up and to contribute at their highest level, to have some acknowledgement for that. But I don't think people actually want to supplant each other. They want to build each other up. And the only time that doesn't happen is when we as a leader forget that we are empowered to empower others. And instead, we become controlling or we become jealous or we become envious and nothing good happens out of jealous envy comparison judgment those are just they're just not things that show up in a great leader now, one of the things i've learned over the years in working with companies is that so many times when a, a person first comes into leadership as a leader they're a purist mm. and they really want to provide leadership and then they get involved in this, and all of a sudden they get caught up in two things, control and power. Yes. And when they get caught up in those two, all of a sudden uh, they, they stop enabling people because it's, it's all about them. It's, and you can always tell it by the use of their pronouns. Are their pronouns singular or plural? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Power and control. Boy, those are some nasty things that we have to deal with, aren't they? Well, we're, it's what we're dealing with in this country right now. Ooh. That is dividing us. Terrible. Uh, but that's a whole different, that's a whole nother uh, discussion. Uh, <laughs> a, a leader who's providing leadership to me is all, also one who adapts the organization. They, they understand, uh, to me, if something ain't broke, break it. That yeah. They're always looking for the next level of improvement, and they don't see change as change. They see change as improvement. Agreed. And especially right now, going through COVID, a lot of the people that I've been working with, they're seeing that the pivots that they ended up making in their business were pivots that they had been talking about before. COVID simply made it more urgent. And the leaders who were able to pivot and hold space for them for them in their business, they, they're going to come out of this just fine. They're, they're, they're working right now in that way. But the people who resist and say, no, we are not going to change. No, we are not going to pivot. No, this is the way we've always done it. They're actually going against how we were designed. And every time I hear somebody say, I just don't like change, or I don't like change for change's sake, or any of that, it's like, you are resisting 
the very nature of who you are. If we were not designed to change, then we would all still be laying on our bellies waiting for our parents to turn us over because that's what happened when we were, you know, infants. And yet our whole life has been about change. The only time we resist it is when we get some weird thought in our head about, I'm not going to be able to handle it, or it scares me, or there's something about it that's just really risky. It's like the only real risk is to resist change. It's the only risk. You know, Pamela, the number one reason I have found that people fight change, because people know when change is necessary, when it needs to happen. And the number one reason I found what I talk to people in a leadership role, the number one reason I find that they fight it is that it it addresses their comfortable routine. Mm. And I, I think most people in a leadership role, they live to be comfortable, not to challenge. Yeah, I wonder if that's true. That's interesting because in that leadership role, if you do end up in that place, like if you end up in that comfort and not changing, then your business is probably not growing as much as it could. And then it becomes, well, do people who really want to thrive, do they want to follow you? So that, that's really fascinating. I had not thought about that. Yeah, because one of the things I think when we're comfortable, it diminishes our curiosity. Oh, and uh-huh. to me, all great leaders are curious people. <laughs> yes. Right. And if you're if you actually are in that place where you're you're prizing comfort over curiosity, it's probably time to be getting a little bit real with yourself about do I really want to still be leading or do I now need to be thinking about succession development? because I'm not sure I want to go any farther in this. Yeah. The, the next characteristic of a person to me who's a, an exceptional leader is that uh, they're a decisive decision maker. They don't procrastinate. They, they have this belief, this trust, this faith in their self. They know what they want for their company, and they make decisions. And these decisions are not a guess. They're researched, and they're also addressed with their people because you got to have that common agenda where everybody's on the same page. Yeah. But I find this to be sometimes a real challenge. Absolutely. Especially when, um, like you said, you may, you're going to make your decision based on data. And yet if we don't have all of the data, how much data do we need to make the decision? And people who are really good leaders, they can make decisions even if they have 30%, 50% of the information they need. And they're going to make that decision, get going, and they will continue to monitor and then make another decision based on what they now know, which I think goes along with the curiosity part of it as well. So I think you're spot on. And I don't think people realize how many decisions we make every single day And yet when it becomes a bigger decision, somehow we paralyze ourselves. When it's like, no, we're really good at making decisions. We just have to make them. Yeah, I think trapped in every decision, there are three A's that we really have to become comfortable with. We have to be willing to adapt, to adjust, and to align. Mm -hmm. And when we have those as our strength, a a decision becomes a part of us uh, that we're very comfortable with. Absolutely. Yeah. Then, Sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I also find that a person who is a exceptional leader, uh, they energize their people. Their presence creates a respect that people want to follow them. Agreed. M- my head is right now going through a bunch of people that I have that I've worked with, you know, that are the CEOs, that kind of level or executive level or president level. And I'm, I'm just going through person by person going, how, how did they get people to follow? And it's interesting because you're right. There are some that show up in that happiness and show up in that. I want to bring life and lift up everybody who's around me. And people want more of that. That's infectious. And then there are some other people that they showed up more from a, 
like a put down from a fear, from a growl, from a throw, anger, from a, you better get in line or I'm going to call you out and I'm going to embarrass you and I'm going to, you know, do things that, that actually show that you might be kind of incompetent. And so people were motivated, but they were motivated from fear. And that was not a place where most people wanted to stay for a very long time. So it's kind of fun to sit here and go through the different, the different ways to get people following. And the ones that I think the ones that just build up the people around them and see the good in the people around them, those companies, they just thrive. People want to bring more to the job because it's also fulfilling for them. Would you agree that the number one thing a human life wants to know is that they matter? I think, yeah, they want to know that they matter. They want to know that they're loved. They want to know that they're seen. Absolutely. Kit, when you work with a company and uh, you you work with the people, you, you work with the individuals or the, uh, the, the team, can you work with that team and pretty well use what you learn in the team as a method of defining the skill of the leader? Say that again. Your audio broke up slightly. I'm sorry. When, when you're working with a team and you get to know these individuals who make up the team, can you see, sense, or feel that their presence is representative of the leader? Yes. That you can yes. define the leader without really ever meeting them through the people? Yes, absolutely. As soon as I start talking to the team. For one second. Uh, Okay, go back to absolutely. Absolutely. As soon as I walk in and start talking with the team, I can tell, first of all, is it safe? Like, are they safe to fail? Are they safe to, to experiment and to learn? Are they safe to say what's actually on their mind? Um, I can tell immediately what, what the leader finds most attractive or what they actually reinforce. I can tell when leaders love to have questions and love brainstorming and looking at opportunities. I can tell when leaders just wanna say, here's what we're doing, go do. I don't want your input. I want you to just go and do the work exactly as I tell you to do it. So 100%, within moments, you can, you can see the leader reflected in the team. Yeah, and I, I think that is that is so important. Uh, you know, one of the things that I have watched over the years uh, is that I think companies used to grow because they had the philosophy of people first, product sec second, and profit third. But mm -hmm. it seems like today that we have switched. We've gone from profit to product to people, and that has caused a lot of disconnect within the organizations. Uh, you know what? I love that because the people who end up hiring me are that first group. They are people first, right? You don't, you don't invest in someone like me unless you actually want your people to get better and you want to know, or you want them to know that you care about them as an organization. And then those people, they end up then going into what is our product and they get innovative and then the profit shows up. But, and I think it's interesting because one I believe is sustainable. The other, I believe, is not. Well, to me, profit is a result of quality people doing a quality job of customer care. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, the exceptional leader to me, the last characteristics, is that they're a person of resilience. You can mm -hmm. knock them down, but they're going to get back up. When they get back up, they're stronger. And they will, you said it earlier, they will allow their people to fail, but they'll not allow their people to waller in the failure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true, isn't it? Like, if we think that the way that we have it mapped out in our mind is the way that it's going to happen, well, the very next day, something interferes with that. And if we are not resilient, it is so easy to simply give up and say, forget about it. So, yeah, absolutely. If you're going to be successful, don't get off the roller coaster. Stay on the ride. The only time you're not going to be successful is, you, is if you quit before you figure it out. So stay in it. You know, one of the things I'm seeing today, Pamela, and it's, uh, I, I watch it with great interest, is that there's so many people in 
what they call a leadership role, who are not secure in their leadership role. So in doing that, to me, they cross a line and try to become friends with their people. Mm. So is there a difference in working to help someone and really leading someone? Yeah, so when I think about leading someone, in that capacity, I have to be able to see the other person. I have to be able to see what they bring to the table. And I have to be able to be okay with myself while I see what they bring to the table. So sort of like what you were talking about earlier, if I'm insecure as a leader, and then I see I hire these great people, but then that makes me insecure, I'll start, I'll start sabotaging everybody, starting with myself. And then in order to get through that, maybe because I don't want to really deal with myself, maybe I then go this other route of starting to be friends with people. But when I get right down to it, the only way that I can actually help somebody else is to look at myself and think, first, I have to believe that they can do what I've asked them to do, right? Because I have to believe that they can do it. And what I keep seeing is that leaders, they say, I've hired great people, I get out of the way, and then I ask them what they've done. And what they've actually done is their actions say, I don't believe you can do what I hired you to do. So the way I'm going to help is I'm going to step in and do it myself. Or the way I'm going to help is I'm going to step in and put another process in place. I'm not going to actually deal with you or deal with me. It, it, gets really, um, it gets really enmeshed in some crazy way until leaders figure out the only way that I can help somebody else is to believe they can do it and then get out of their way let them actually do it, which means that I probably have to deal with myself every single day that I'm trying to lead other people. Yeah. One of the things I believe is that you and I cannot lead another person past the point where we are. Yeah. And people are not limited most of the time by their self. They're limited by the lack of leadership. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because as I've been working with companies, we've been coming at it from this place of Whenever I come at any situation from a place of, I need to step in and help, I'm probably going to mess it up because it implies that the person I hired can't do it, or it implies that there's a way that it needs to be done that's not being done. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in from a disempowered state. And as soon as I step in from a disempowered state, I'm going to muddy the water. So if I really want to be able to lead, the very first thing I have to do is pay attention to what is the mental, what is the mental game that I'm bringing into the conversation? And if I can get clear on my mental game, then all of a sudden I can show up in this harmonic way that's totally plugged in, totally resourceful, totally living my values from my authentic self. And from that place, I can now have any conversation and I'm coming at it from, I know you can do this. Let's be big people and have big conversation about it, but I'm going to have to get right with myself. And a lot of leaders do not get right with themselves before they step into leadership. It goes back to what you said. They think they have the title, therefore people should follow. And that's not how it works. You have to be really good at being yourself before anybody follows. One of the things I see when I go into a lot of companies, Pamela, is that uh, they really aren't building a company, they're building an orphanage. Oh, interesting. Where what they're what do doing mean? is they're collecting people and they're collecting them and they're keeping them in their weakness. They're yep. not showing them how to grow and bring value through their own personal growth. Yeah. Yeah, because that takes a whole nother level of leadership, right? I can have a title, I can collect people, I can tell everybody what to do, I can make all the decisions, 
But if I don't actually deal with myself to bring out the best in everybody and be really secure with myself while they do that, then I'm probably not really being a leader. I might be being a dictator. I might be an owner. I might be a figurehead, but I'm not sure that I would actually be considered a leader at that moment. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a very introspective question now. You ready? Ready. Take a deep breath. Okay. Our world today is crowded with people who call themselves a coach. Mm. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I get emails all the time and uh, from people who want to be a coach. And when you look at them, it's like they're all in a mixing bowl spinning. And what makes Pamela different? What, take, what will get her, uh, our, a lot of people look at her and want to take her out of the mixing bowl and, and let her be Pamela without comparing her to everybody else. What makes you unique? Yeah, so, you know, going through the, the John Maxwell training, you know, there were 500 people in the room. And, you know, I, I listened to everybody else. I listened to you. I listened to, you know, my mentors. And it's really easy, I think, to just get into the doubt, right? Like, uh, there are a whole bunch of coaches out there and everybody's smart and everybody has their own place. And for me, the hardest part was actually coming to grips with the thing that makes me unique has nothing to do with content. It has nothing to do with the niche market. It has to do with there are people on this planet that resonate with me that will not resonate with anybody else. And there are people on the planet who will not resonate with me. And so there's room for all of the coaches because there are millions of people. Some people are looking for weight loss coaches. Some people are looking, you know, for presentation skills coaches. The people who find me are people who are looking for a holistic life that really does resonate in the idea of we are created to be happy and unstoppable in order to change the world. And some people, when they hear that message, it resonates and they're like, yes, that is me. I am tired of suffering. I am tired of carrying around all of this baggage that I, that I bring into every situation. And we do that through business, but we look at it that we are whole people, that there is no such thing as business life and personal life. There is simply life and we show up for it in the best way possible. So for me, the thing that makes me different is when people hear, I want to be happy and unstoppable and change the world, they wanna work with me. So how do we find you? Yes, well, you can find me at pamelamum.com is my website, www.pamelamum.com. You can find me on Facebook at Pamela Mum, and you can find me on LinkedIn, Pamela Mum. <laughs> it's very boring. It's all Pamela Mum. <laughs> There's a lot of, probably way too much Pamela Mum in the world, but I love it. And, and I do welcome people to, to hop in, be in conversation. And sometimes it isn't even, you know, they don't know why they show up, but they do. And then down the road, it's like, ah, that's why you were there. That's why you that's why you found me on Facebook. That's why you looked at my website. So, yeah, thank you. Well, the thing I, I really like about you, and I saw this when TC was interviewing you, and then in the, br the brief moments we had to talk, is I think you're very authentic. And I think if people are looking for that person who's not going to play a game with them, uh, but who is going to bring whom they are, to the table, then I think that you're a person that they ought to reach out to. And I, I can't begin to tell you how much I, uh, I have enjoyed this time of you and I just being able to chat and to be able to have this conversation and let people touch a little bit about whom you really are, because you are a very unique person in the midst of a world that wants to all look alike. Mm. And I, I respect that about you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. 
yeah, our conversations are interesting and I appreciate like just all of the wisdom that you bring into the conversations and you, you have a tendency to bring out the best in people. And it's so obvious that you care about people that you, you do authentically listen and you do listen from a compassionate and caring place to everybody who has the privilege of crossing paths with you. I'm sure that they know how blessed they are to have you in their life. Well, can we do this again sometime at some point? Absolutely. Let's do it. I'll even. Okay. Uh, Thank you for joining us for this episode of, you know, Let's Talk Human Behavior. And I think if you've seen and you've heard from Pam today, you understand her commitment to really helping people in leadership and in life learn to be strong because you and I were not put on this earth to be a carbon copy. We're here as an original, and it's in the original that we bring value to people. So until we see each other again, uh, you take care, you have a great time, and spend your time learning more about you, because the more about you you learn, the greater your value to other people. We'll talk again soon.